And only those people in the know could get a copy or even knew it existed. And I saw all these other books, you know, in the airport bookshops and all these other books which were, you know, Christianity and strange teachings. And I thought, my goodness, why don't we put more books out there for sale? So people at an airport, people browsing the bookshop can actually pick up a book. And the Dalai Lama does that and it's very successful. It's spreading Buddhism in the world. And you have to actually adapt to the, you know, the realities of our world. Most people will not come into a temple. And these days, one of the reasons is they're afraid to come into a temple because they don't know what they're supposed to do, what the etiquette is. And they see all these symbols, and am, am I supposed to chant for Amitabha? What is a chant? What am I supposed to do? See all these other people taking their shoes off. Am I supposed to take off my shoes here or there? What am I supposed to do? Am I allowed to sit in a chair or should I sit on a, on a, down there? Can I sort of actually shake the hands of a monk or can I just say, hi guy? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And because of that, people just get so uptight about coming into temples. So, one of my missions is to take the temple out to the people. Put it on the internet, put it in the bookshops. And the only way you can do that is actually by getting a publisher and the publisher sells the book. All any, you know of that book, the royalties, which I'm supposed to get, which is all goes to our Buddhist society, is I think, I think for the ones coming to Malaysia here, about 50 cents per book. That's Australian. So that's, what's that about? A ringgit and a half. A ringgit and a half per book, yeah. Because most of it goes in the, the bookshops, the distribution network, the publishers. So you don't, you know, you, the monastery doesn't, or rather our Buddhist center doesn't get much out of that. But the point is there that it does get it out into the bookshops. And you get good results of that. Already, that there's two schools in Perth. One of them is a government school, one is an Anglican school. Was it St. Mark's Anglican School in Hillary's? The fellow saw it um, reviewed in the newspaper because it was a book for sale. And he bought a copy, he liked it so much, he's reading out about two or three classes in the school, in an Anglican school, a Christian school. That would never have happened if it was a book for free distribution just in my temple. Even the, the Premier of Western Australia, Dr. Jeff Gallup, because the, like in Malaysia, Australia is made up of states, it's a federation of states. And each um, state has its own legis legislature, its own government, and each actually uh, state is actually quite powerful. The federal government looks after defence and you know, foreign policy, but many of the decisions are actually made by this, each individual states. So he's quite a powerful man. So he got a copy of the book and he wrote back to me saying how much he liked it, a personal letter. And when I saw him a few weeks later, he said, Oh, Ajahn Brahm, my favourite author, which is very nice. And you're influencing government that way. Apparently, I met uh, his minister for planning and she said to me, he said, you don't know how much he's been influenced by Buddhism because in the cabinet meetings, whenever there's an argument, as there will be in politics, the Premier, he shuts us all up and says, be quiet, we should be more Buddhist about this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. I mean, you actually make an influencer. So in order to influence people, sometimes you have to publish. And my hope, my Christmas, New Year's resolution is this, because the Premier of Western Australia, Dr. Gallup, he's a very close friend of Tony Blair. In fact, he was Tony and Cherry's best man at their wedding. They went to Oxford together. So my hope is going to send a copy of my book to Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair is going to read it and give it as a Christmas present to George Bush. <laughs> And that way I'm going to save the world. <laughs> but that wouldn't happen if it was a free distribution book. So that's why we do that. It's, it's marvellous if it can be for free. But then for free things, sometimes they don't actually get out there into the world. Unfortunately, that's, that's the way of the world. We made a compromise there. We'd like the Tibetan Buddhists do that. So we're going to try and see, see how that works. So please, I apologise if it's on sale. We don't get anything out of this. But what we do get, all I get out of that book 
is a sore hand. The number of copies I've signed. <laughs> We're trying to get Dharma out there into the world. That's why we said it. Get in the bookshops. Is that okay? Any, I can actually see the other side of the story about setting things, but sometimes you just have to do that. I can't see any other way of doing it. Because we live in a materialist world. And bookshops will never put, you won't see any books in borders for fee distribution. So you have to do that. Next question. Under Buddhism, you are supposed to reduce your attachments to worldly things like relationships and material things. Would marrying and having a family then be against this? Are you creating, taking on more attachments and making it more difficult to practice a path of letting go? How do you reconcile these two seemingly opposites? Not everybody has got the good karma or the intentions or the ability to live a monastic life. And if everybody did become a monk or nun, who would be able to feed me? So we do have, it's always been the case ever since the time of the Buddha, there will be a section of the Buddhist population, a very small proportion, who become monks and nuns, and other people would become lay Buddhists. And I said, as a lay Buddhist, you can still become enlightened, but it's a little bit more difficult, that's all. So if you are going to get married, you still have to practice a degree of celibacy in marriage. In other words, once you're married and you see a man sees a beautiful girl, you're just like a monk, you can't take her. You've got one woman to look after. So sometimes you may see someone, oh, she's really nice. We have to say no. Just like young monks have to say no, I've got a commitment to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. So I can't allow that lust to progress. I might lose my precepts. The same as a lay person. You have to say no, you've got a commitment to marriage. So there's also a degree of celibacy in marriage as well. A woman sees a nice guy. No, I'm married. I can't do that. You have to say no. You have to have restraint. So even in marriage you have to practice similar restraint to actually to stop you know, the lust or the greed coming up. In a marriage you're committed to a family. You've got to forget about yourself. It's not me that's important anymore. It's us. So there's a lot of selflessness in a marriage, a lot of giving up. When you have children, my goodness, there's a heap of giving up there. You have to give up your sleep when you look after little babies, when they cry in the middle of the night. There's a lot of detachment happening there. So the marriage and the family, if you know how to use it properly, can be a wonderful spiritual path for you. It's a path of letting go. A selflessness, it's not for you anymore. Is for the family. And you know that as a man sacrifices, they work really hard and they don't really do it for themselves, they do it for the children or for the wife. The wife does it for the family. We do it for each other. And that family, if it's a vehicle for selflessness, giving up desire, and you notice how hard it is in a family to give up anger and ill will because you're living close together. And when two things are close together, they rub up against each other, that's called fiction, that's heat, that's anger. It's very easy. I know many people, they had like a working family, the wife went out to work, the husband went out to work, they were quite happy, but when one of them retired or both of them retired, they both lived at home all day, they got on each other's nerves and that was terrible for their relationship. Too close together, too long, you tend to rub up against each other. Fiction is natural. So you have to learn that way, learn how to give up ill will, to be selfless, learn how to forgive in your marriage. What a wonderful path of spirituality it can be if you know how to make use of it. So you can be married, you can have kids and you can make it a path, not of attachment, of letting go. You can make it into a path of attachment. My kids, they have to go to university. They have to go to university in the West. My kids, they have to become doctors and engineers. My kids, they're not your kids. You nurture them. You're like the gardener. And a gardener, if it's got a good seed or a bad seed, it doesn't really matter so much about the gardener. Even with a bad seed, you can't do so much. Even with a good seed, you may be the laziest gardener of all. You get a beautiful seed and a beautiful plant comes out of that. So sometimes it's not the parents' success or failure. You can, have, you can be a hopeless parent and have this beautiful son or daughter. 
I've seen that. I've seen some children. They're amazing. They're just so good, so kind, so intelligent. And their parents are real awful people. I say, wow, what's going on there? It's because they had a beautiful seed, karma from the past. And you've got some children, they've got the most wonderful parents. They're not indulgent. They're disciplined at the right time. They're caring. But their children become monsters. They, sometimes they'd come up to me and say, what did I do which was wrong? So you didn't do anything wrong. You're like the gardener who didn't have a good, good plant, good seed to work with. You did your very best. So that way that our parenthood has to be with detachment. You have to give everything you've got to your kids and then finally let them go. You have to be like the bird who sits on the eggs until you've got a very sore bottom. If you think you get sore sitting meditation, Think of a bird. They haven't got a soft cushion. They've got these hard, bumpy eggs to sit on. Now that must make your bottom really sore. So the next time you get a sore bottom, just think of the poor birds. <laughs> and not only that, that once the little chicks are hatched, they've got to spend all day finding food for these squawking little monsters. Squawk, squawk. No matter how many worms you put in there, they want more. That's what you do. You sacrifice so much. But once the birds can fly, the little chicks are hatched, they're grown up and they can fly. At that point, great, mum and dad just go off by themselves. You can fly now, kids, off you go. And they don't even bother again to look after their kids. The kids don't go home on Chinese New Year to <laughs> see, see their parents. You're not bothered with them. You're free now. They don't come back you know, to ask for a loan from the parents. So once you've grown up, the literally the children are thrown out of the nest, now you go and look after yourself. And that's actually, the birds are much wiser than human beings. Sometimes your children are 25, 30, 35. They still haven't got a job. And you will not kick them out. That's not kind for your children. Sometimes giving them a bit of independence is like kicking them out of the nest. Now you strive like I had to. You work like I had to. You make your house like I had to. So that's being kind. But sometimes when we're attached, we think, oh, I can't throw him out of the house. Oh, he's got nowhere to stay. Oh, he might, he might get lonely or he might have nothing to eat. That's just, that's not compassion, that's attachment. Sometimes we have to be wise, compassion. Out of the house, go. One of my disciples, he told me that when his son was dating, he told me he had to come home at a certain time. And one evening he came home, he was supposed to be coming by 1 a.m. By 1 a.m. he wasn't there, but he could see him coming up the, the, the road in his car, he was five minutes late. So the father locked the house completely, and when the son started knocking, trying to get in, he wouldn't open the door. His son had to sleep outside all night. After that, the son never came home late again. Sometimes you have to do that and be firm so people know the boundaries. When your children know the boundaries, then they usually behave accordingly. So it can be a wonderful way of uh, having non-attachment, letting go, but also service. Okay? Any questions on that? And of course, I'm the expert on families, never having had one. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, my, oh, yeah. My apologies, okay, I did that one already, sorry. With the greatest of respect, oh, oh, could you please read the questions slowly so that we can understand what you are reading? Thank you. <laughs> so you're asking if I can read the question slowly, so I will try. <laughs> if you fall asleep because you are bored, it is not my fault. <laughs> Dear Adjo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not that slow. I take your point, thank you, I'm sorry for making a, 
I laugh at this. Dear Ajahn, if we meditate in a group, we are disturbed by the noise of cushion dropping, coughing, etc. If we meditate alone, we're afraid of being alone. Please advise Sadhu. It is a classic case of the fault-finding mind. The fault-finding mind, if I'm alone, I'm lonely. If I'm with someone else, I'm crowded in. If it's, we turn the air conditioners on, it's too cold. If we don't turn them on, it's too hot. If I read it too fast, I can't hear it. If I read it too slow, I fall asleep. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? We've got fault-finding minds. So the point is that it is good enough. If the cushion drops, that is wonderful. It wakes me up. If I meditate alone, it's wonderful. I can have a bit of a rest when I nod off. It's wonderful. Whatever happens, have this, this wonderful, uh, not fault-finding mind, this mind of gratitude. It's just so wonderful that I can go out there and eat a breakfast and have something to eat, even though it's far, far too much. And I think, wouldn't it be wonderful just, you know, to have just like a piece of toast, one piece of toast and a cup of tea? That's all I would really like. But people bring all this stuff over there. And if I had a fault finding mind, I think, can't you leave me alone? I just want to have a little bit of breakfast. And people hover, it was like this morning, many of you came in, it wasn't a breakfast, it was a photo op. <laughs> <laughs> and even in breakfast, people ask me questions about Dhamma. Imagine that was you from the time you got up in the morning, at least I'm alone in my shower. People don't come in there to ask me questions. <laughs> But I don't have that fault-finding mind. I just have so much gratitude that people are interested enough in Dharma to ask questions. They've got enough faith to come and bring this food, which sometimes they put so much effort into. I don't care if it gives me indigestion. It just I feel so happy and privileged to be part of this wonderful act of Dharma. Actually to bring the best out in people, to bring them joy and happiness. Some people get up so early in the morning, and this is their holiday today. They came all this way to feed me. Oh, that's so wonderful. I've got so much gratitude. You've got so much gratitude to your cushion for actually to supporting you. You've got so much gratitude to the Chimpaka Buddhist Lodge. All the people who donated to actually to build this hall. And all the people who clean it, look after it, the organizers. It's just so wonderful. Thank you so much. Instead of thinking, oh, they could have had, you know, instead of marble, they could have had some of these, this thick carpet which was much softer. They could have had like personal air conditioning. Because you get these little things just over your head. <laughs> and you can actually get the right temperature just for yourself. You could have like a room with an ensuite. Even more than that, get a room with an ensuite and your own personal butler. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? With room service in the meditation retreat. <laughs> now the point is you can always find fault if you have a fault-finding mind. So instead of having a fault-finding mind, we are actually so wonderful that a person is actually meditating next to us and trying their best. If they cough, I'm so sorry, it's just wonderful that you've actually managed to do so much non-coughing throughout the time you've been on this retreat. I'm so grateful for all those times you haven't dropped the cushion. Thank you so much, little being sitting next to me, my friend in meditation, my companion on the path. So it's impossible to get ill will or hatred. Even when somebody coughs, ah, it's so cute the way you cough. <laughs> so the point is that we don't disturb the world, we don't disturb others. We don't disturb life. It's not life disturbs us. It's not the sound of the cushion disturbs our meditation. We disturb the dropping cushion. We disturb the cough, that's all. So this is what happens. If you've got a fault-finding mind, wherever you are, it's not good enough. Even in jhana, if you've got a fault-finding mind, only second jhana, when can I get into third jhana? 
<laughs> Some people like that, you know. <laughs> 